Episode 46, The Paradox. Welcome to The Paradox with your attending, Dr. Eric Larson. He is a practicing anesthesiologist and clinical assistant professor at Michigan State University College of Human Medicine. Listen in as he takes you behind the scenes of what practicing medicine in today's ever-changing world is like with another doctor. The Paradox is a fun and accidentally informative show for physicians, patients, or anyone who has ever found themselves in a waiting room. Welcome to The Paradox. I'm your host, Dr. Eric Larson. Thank you for joining me as we explore the U.S. medical system in a fun and informative format where you can learn about what physicians face through expert analysis. Today's expert is Dr. John Legrand, a private practice OBGYN, who practices in Grand Rapids. Whereas the interview unfolds, you'll learn about his very unconventional way of practicing obstetrics. An obvious tension in medicine is the use of non-physicians for medical care. Traditionally, there have been nurses, other ancillary support staffs, from anywhere from janitors to physical therapists, phlebotomists, medical students, residents, and other people who help deliver the medical care for a patient when they're in the hospital or in sort of setting. Uh, Recently, and I would say within the last 10 years, there's been an explosion of what are termed mid-level providers. A physician assistants are PAs. Uh, they've been around for a long time. But there's been a real growth in nurse practitioners, nurse midwives, CRNAs, which are nurse anesthetists, anesthesiologist assistants, athletic trainers, and others who are providing care in what are deemed as physician extenders within the hospital setting. This obviously puts a lot of pressure on tension between specialties as those who have far less training or different sorts of training now want to expand their role and their scope of how they practice. Uh, they usually do this through legislative means as, by the same token, legislative reasons are what prevent them from practicing medicine or their craft in the way they want. And so there's always a tension between medical societies or be and these other professional societies for nurse practitioners or PAs or whomever. So today we're going to talk about nurse midwives, and I admittedly know very little about nurse uh, midwives and midwifery, uh, since I would just do anesthesia. Uh, but we're going to explore how I think they're a little bit different than the other uh, providers that are non-physicians, I guess, who are providing standardized care within a hospital setting, in that most of the people who are providing these mid-level uh, support are essentially performing the same tasks as the physician, like exactly the same. Uh, you might see a PA who will be a first assistant surgery, or um, uh, but essentially, if you go to a clinic, nurse practitioners aren't doing a job that's significantly different than a physician. Uh, they might not have prescription privileges. They might have certain limitations in their practice and their scope of ability of, to provide certain types of care. But essentially, they're working the same, and they have significantly, uh, dramatically, oftentimes uh, redu reduced amounts of training and experience, generally speaking, uh, and so. You can see the obvious tension that you have between these specialties. I feel like nurse midwifery is a little different, and that's that their focus is entirely on the birthing process. And an obstetrician, although they are an expert in taking care of problems in the, and, and dealing with routine pregnancies and deliveries, their expertise is a little bit different, and it's not focused primarily just on the a normal vaginal delivery, which we're going to talk about today. And so because of that, I think you can have a different sort of collaborative process that you're not able to have as easily uh, with the other uh, mid-level providers in medicine. I hope you'll recognize the nuance in our discussion and I think in the roles that they serve. Anyway, I think it's a very fascinating discussion as we talk about ways of kind of radically changing the C-section rate in this country, which I found really interesting, and we actually didn't even go into the specific numbers, but in the institution that Dr. Legrand works in, uh, just his very small practice, which for a volume standpoint is pretty tiny compared to what the total volume in the hospital, because his C-section rate is so much lower than the standard uh, rate that is pretty typical anywhere in this country, is it has lowered actually the hospital C-section rate by a couple percent just because of his practice is so much outside the norm as far as... Uh, their, their section rate. So I think that's really interesting, and I think you'll get a lot out of this discussion. Obviously, you can find the show notes page to Dr. Legrand's practice, 
a couple of little uh, links to website sites will be available at the show notes page, which will be at theparadox.com slash 046. Obviously, if you've not yet subscribed to this, I absolutely encourage you to subscribe and share this with your friends. It costs absolutely nothing. If you feel crippled with guilt about listening to a program like this and want to help support the show, uh, all the money that's raised at the Patreon page, which is at patreon.com slash the paradox, uh, will go towards the production and promotion of the show. But without further ado, I'd like to introduce you to Dr. John Legrand, a little bit of his origin story and what he's doing differently in obstetrics. Enjoy. Well, hello. This is Eric Larson. I'm here with my friend, longtime friend, Dr. John Legrand, obstetrician, gynecologist, who's been practicing in the Grand Rapids area for as long as I've been practicing here. And so I get the rare treat of having him in studio. And we say that with a smirk if you saw my studio. Um, but Dr. Grand, thank you so much for joining me. Well, thank you for having me, Eric. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I brought you on because I think you have a really interesting story. And when we we met a couple of months ago, we we talked about your practice. And so we're going to get to that in a little bit. But first, I want to just back up a little bit, and let's just talk about your origin story. Right? This is like a sure. this is like the Avengers here. We need to find out <laughs> how you be, how you came to be what you are. So why don't you just go into maybe just growing up a little bit? Why you sure. ended up going to medicine, and then uh, we'll go from there. Well, I, and to quote the infamous, I started out as a child. My, my father was a Christian Reformed preacher, and so I grew up a little bit of everywhere. I was actually born in Grand Rapids uh, right around Christmas and uh, spent the first five years of my life in inner city Chicago, moved from there to England where my father was getting his Ph.D. in New Testament theology, moved from there to Halifax, Nova Scotia, where I spent uh, pretty much my formative years, grades 4 through 12, and had a good old time. Halifax is a wonderful city. Uh, <laughs> it really is. It's got a, a, an amazing educational system, and it's got a, an amazing music department. I was able to uh, learn trumpet and play in the orchestra and the band and, and uh, be involved in musicals and all sorts of wonderful things and debate and, and parliament and, and had just a wonderful time and got to, to travel. Uh, and then I, uh, as a good Christian Reformed boy, uh, kind of wanted to figure out what this old Christian Reformed church was. And Calvin College is in Grand Rapids, and that's where everybody in my, my family had ever gone to <laughs> yeah, college. Right, uh-huh. And this is Mecca to the Christian Reformed Church. And so uh, my older brother had, had gone to Calvin, and I said, decided, why not? I'll go there too. And so I traveled back to Grand Rapids, Michigan, and uh, discovered uh, that I was Dutch. <laughs> which which is a bit of a surprise. And if you saw me, it wouldn't surprise you. But I'm a bit of Dutch camouflage. Uh, the, the name is French. It's, yeah. it's not Dutch. But all the other family names are as Dutch as you got. I'm actually 100% pureborn. Uh, French oh. Huguenot is, oh, is how the, okay. the French name got in there. Uh, the refugees to the Netherlands in the uh, 17th century. Either that or one of Napoleon's deserters. It sounds more <laughs> romantic. But, uh, so, so, but I'm, I'm six foot two and, you know, 200 plus pounds and I do the Dutch bodybuilding system, which means I'm a 48 long and I'm just, (laughs) but I'm not blonde and I don't have blue eyes. So I I fit in camouflage nicely, but, uh, I graduated Calvin, which is again, a wonderful school. Uh, and, uh, I decided to be an English major because I always wanted to be a doctor. My, my brother was always going to be the lawyer. I was going to be the doctor. And uh, I always had that in mind. So I did all the prereqs from medical school and was the editor of the school magazine and played in the orchestra and played in the band and did all the fun things, was on student senate, had a good old time, and then went to University of Michigan where I got to be diversity, which is another interesting thing as a big white guy because I was an English major. Yeah. And so... I survived medical school, and University of Michigan was uh, was another awesome, awesome time. Uh, tremendous. I got to live in a fraternity uh, with 32 other medical students. And uh, Is that still open now, by the way? New Sigma Nu is no longer open. I was in a medical fraternity at Iowa as well, and it I th- I want to say it closed a couple years after. It, they were sort of just was going away, I think, yeah. at that time. It basically was like a co-op. Yeah, right? Phi, Phi Chi had, was, I think is still going because they did the uh, the notes. They, they were the scribe service. Uh, New Sigma Nu had actually been founded by the uh, the Mayo Brothers all the way back when. Oh. But uh, the economics of it were, were not good. And the parties were great. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, and the football games were, were always a, a wonderful weekend. But uh, graduated that and, and came back to Grand Rapids, which was 
after traveling my whole childhood, uh, it was sort of the ancestral home and did my residency at Butterworth Hospital, which was just an amazing institution, uh, a blend of community and and uh, academic programs that you just don't see anymore, mm-hmm. yeah. um, where the, the faculty are all in it because they love what they're doing and they want to teach and they they just really engaged and pulled you to do so many things and dragged you into cases and and would socialize with you and would engage there was a, a joie de vivre a, an esprit de corps just that unfortunately is is I'm I'm afraid has been one of the casualties of the businessification mm-hmm. of medicine over the years um, and then I went into practice so so for to back up a tiny bit, there was someone famous you went to high school with that we have to mention briefly, right? I, actually, uh, grades four through twelve with Sarah McLaughlin. Yeah, yeah. right. So she's yes. kind of a big deal. She she's a little bit of a big deal. <laughs> she uh, she grew up two blocks away from me, uh, and uh, her her younger brother and I often got into fights, uh, <laughs> and uh, and Sarah uh, was in the class with me and. Um, Sarah had her own way. Uh, she was a little bit of an outsider. Uh, we both lived on the wrong side of the tracks, as it were, yeah. at, at school there. Um, we, we were closer to the grain elevators than the uh, and, and the port in Halifax uh-huh. uh, than, than Point Pleasant Park. So was she doing lots of singing and stuff too back then? I no, hate to get off track much. No, curiously, she, she would uh, do some singing. She, mm-hmm. she mostly... Sang with, you know, she had her own smaller bands and things, okay, and, so and and sang with a few people. But the music scene in Halifax is amazing. Um, everybody coming to the states to do tours would stop off in Halifax as the first stop, uh, just for flights. And, sure, yeah, and yeah. amazing bands would play uh, our gym in high school. <laughs> uh, I was on the lighting crew and 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 got to you know n- do the lights. The police played our gym. Um, I mean, <laughs> I don't know if your listeners know who the police were, but that would have been Sting's band. Right. Uh, <laughs> right. So, so, uh, but, but no, Sarah wasn't really in the organized uh, music scene. I mean, she wasn't the, the music, the, the difference in the Canadian school system and the American school system is phenomenal. We had the top provincial high school football team and I was the pet band. Uh, my, my buddy Creighton Doan uh, and I would go to the games and he played drums and I played trumpet and we stood in the stands and, and we were the band. Uh, there was no marching band. Um, so you brought that sort of American culture to, yeah, to Canada, right? That, that was it. Uh, and and <laughs> But the musical was the single biggest uh, social event and, and ac- ac- extracurricular in the high school. 400 kids out of a 1,200 school uh, auditioned for the musical. Whoa. Uh, and, you know, to toot my own horn, I got the lead. Yeah. Uh, but Sarah didn't audition. That that wasn't her style. Yeah, sure. Uh, she simply uh, graduated, went to Toronto, and got a uh, Sony contract. <laughs> <laughs> Kudos to Sarah. The rest is history, right? Oh, she, she forged her own path big time. So I think uh, before we get to your current practice, yeah. I, uh, and you mentioned, we sort of walked us through uh, your training. And so you University of Michigan, sort of a standard sort of, I guess, training. You end up, I guess, why did you go to OB? What, what did when med school drew you to OB? <laughs> Because right, I mean, I'd say right now it's a little unusual for men to be in, to go into OB. I don't know that the interest is different, but and and, it's, and it was kind of unusual at the time. To mm-hmm. to be honest, you you don't, I don't think anybody, you kind of get caught by OB. You 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 get, you can't go into anything else. Yeah. When you put it this way, everybody thought I was going into orthopedics. If you met me, you'd think I was an orthopod. Yeah. Everybody thought I was, I, I, I have a wood shop. I like to mm-hmm. do things with power tools and everybody assumed I was going to go into orthopedics. Yeah. I assumed I was going to go into orthopedics, but the orthopedists um, that I met just didn't, they weren't having fun. They were so competitive. They were so aggressive. They were so, they felt like they were fighting all the time mm-hmm. just to out thump each other's chests yeah and and so that wasn't appealing whereas the obstetricians were having fun now they were up all night they were they were sleep deprived but they were having a great time and 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 the they 
one of the residents I met, Dave Subert, at, at uh, Beaumont Hospital, I remember in the middle of the night, my first rotation there, he came into the call room. I had just laid down at two in the morning. He said, John, John, you got to get up. She's a grand multip. You got to get there before the baby <laughs> falls out. And he grabbed me and he dragged me into this room and he threw me on a chair and he said, get it. And I caught the baby. And, and that was just amazing. Yeah. And at the end of the rotation, all the residents say, you're going to interview, aren't you? You're going to interview, aren't you? And I'm like, for what? <laughs> and they said, for OB. And it had never occurred to me yeah. to go into OB. But then I realized I'm going, I'm good at this. Yeah. I was terrified of the breast practical exam in the first two years of medical school. Mm -hmm. I didn't go to the voluntary pelvic exam. A workshop because back then it was voluntary to get experience in a pelvic exam. I was more. I went to Calvin College. <laughs> it's Christian Reformed, right? That's and and yeah. and so then the first day on the rotation, I realized, oh, this isn't personal. This is just business. This yeah. is medicine, right. and these people need help. And this is something that you have to be able to talk about. Mm -hmm. And it turns out I can talk about it and. I guess I'm good at it. Well, and I and I don't know if what it was like for you, but I think for me, even coming into private practice, I want to say the first five to eight years, it is hard not to get emotional. Yeah. Uh, with in for me, it's my experience with deliveries is always in the C-section room. I don't actually get the deliveries in the the patient room. Right. I put the epidural in, I go away, right. and then I find out later that they've delivered. Uh, but it is really hard uh, with the emotions of the parents, and you have a you have a mother there who is vulnerable. You know, she's oftentimes mostly awake for me uh, yeah. with C section or with a spinal or an epidural, and you're trying to keep distract them basically because they know something's yep. going on. It feels weird and stuff, and then suddenly that baby starts crying, and it's like I don't need to be there anymore because now right. there's that distraction. And just it's I mean it's truly magical. I mean it's probably the only mat as a parent. You feel that for sure, but you feel it too as a clinician, right? Well, and, and it's, you think about it, it's the only positive association you have with a medical event. Most medical events are, are not something you're looking forward to, not something you want to happen. There's something you're dreading, something you wanted to avoid. Yeah. Um, and, and a birth is something you can't wait for, you want to have happen. And it's terrifying that it might go wrong. And, and the ability to be able to, to safeguard it. And occasionally things do go wrong. And being the guy who can all of a sudden step in and make sure that it doesn't go wrong is wonderful. Yeah. It's absolutely thrilling. And, and everybody who works on that unit lives for that. And, and you don't talk about it because it, it, it almost sounds, you don't want to say we do this for fun because it sounds almost ghoulish, but because you don't, you don't want bad things to happen, but you train for them. You yeah. train for them again and again and again so that when they happen, you can see what's happening and you can, you can change it. Right. And, and that, that's great. That's why we go into medicine and, and that's what catches you. And then you realize, oh, I, damn it, I like this. Yeah. And then, yeah, then you get um, up all night. <laughs> right. I mean, it's, there's no question it's a lot of work and the hours are weird and, and liability, all those sorts of things. But there, and I tell my, when I tell people I enjoy doing some OB, I don't, I don't think I want to do it every day yeah. um, personally for anesthesia, but I do enjoy it because it's the only place people are actually excited to see you see me. Usually, it's like, oh, this is the guy who makes me throw up, or whatever. <laughs> you know. At yep. best, I just get you know, you feel like terrible but, afterwards. But the days of that are changing, which is a little bit what we talked about. Yeah. Um, because the evolution of medicine, the businessification of medicine, and I don't, I don't want to trump your questions, but that old model of of taking that personal relationship of of being there. And knowing the situation and, and not having it be a shift is changing yeah. because the lifestyle took it out on the doctors. It's pretty hard on, on the clinicians. Yeah. And so let's talk about your practice then. So sure. when you, when you finished residency, you went into what I would say 
And uh, we talked about this ahead of time. Just that we're not going to talk about any specific health systems. Clearly, it's obvious if you could, you know, if anyone has <laughs> access to Google, you can figure out exactly what we're talking about. But most of the principles we're discussing today are not specific to any institution because I think most institutions um, in any sort of large urban area or suburban area are going to be pretty similar to, to uh, what's happening yeah. where we are. These are national trends. Yeah, I mean, these are trends that are – and, and I, there's nothing – insidious about anything i don't think and or nefarious is probably a better word uh so you went into what we i call probably a traditional practice right yeah. where you i joined a group practice you joined a group practice of a number of other physicians and you had a, you were a typical ob let's say right so you got how it. long that was what 10 years or so or? actually closer to well uh, about six years six years okay and um so why don't you just uh talk about what it was about that practice that you thought I want to look for something a little different for myself that it fits me better. What, uh, it, it, it's all you know, happenstance and circumstance. You, sometimes you don't go looking for things. Things find you. Sure. Um, <clears throat> in, in my case, I joined a group. And, and classically, traditionally, when I graduated residency, most practices had four doctors. Uh, and, and that was just the way it was. And when I, when I graduated residency, I was in a class of four graduates with two men and two women. And, uh, and it was starting to be, be a challenge for guys to get a job. Mm -hmm. Uh, men, male obstetrician gynecologists were not getting recruited. Women could get a job anywhere they wanted. Uh, but if you wanted to be somewhere, um, you had to struggle and look out for yourself if you were a male. Um, because it was thought that you couldn't survive if you didn't have a woman in your practice. So all the established practices were looking to replace old white guys, typically, with young women. Right. Uh, so as a young white guy, I was, you know, <laughs> looking to survive. Um, and so the practice that I joined, uh, and I will eternally, eternally be grateful, uh, to Carl Brandt who, who, uh, threw me a lifeline and he said he, he was full of refugees. He, he had, uh, a practice with three other, uh, white guys who had fallen from various practices over, over the past 20 years and banded together to, to create a very solid group of four good old fashioned OBGYNs with just good reputations. And mm -hmm. Carl was an amazing, uh, uh guy with a great skills and, and, and a, a solid reputation and practice. Um, and he was looking to keep things going. And as he explained, you, you can't make money in, in, in medicine, uh, by, you know, getting busier anymore. You had to make it by you know, saving money. And the best way to save money was to lower your overhead. Mm -hmm. Best way to lower your overhead is share costs. And so he said, if we get you on board, we're going to share our overhead. We're going to lower our costs and maybe I can work less because he was looking at trying to retire. Sure. Well, six years later, Carl decided he <laughs> was going to retire and he, he uh, took the added step of selling the office we lived in <laughs> at the time. <laughs> so that kind of forced sale of the building and the practice d disbanded. Yeah. Um, and at that point, uh, the different refugees went their different ways. One, one went to Spring Lake, one went to Forest Hills, uh, one went down to Grand Rapids, uh, and I and uh, another young partner that I had recruited found a spot right next door to Butterworth Hospital. Uh, and so that was an amazing opportunity where, which was only two blocks from my house. And so I bought that space mm -hmm. and, uh, from there decided to be a much smaller practice and for productivity, uh, no longer had to drive an hour round trip to get back and forth to the hospital, which allowed me to all of a sudden work as fast as I wanted and not have to reschedule and cancel stuff, which was huge. Yeah, sure. Um, from there, uh, my and, wife, and I want to interrupt you for a second, just so what you're talking about here is, as most people know, if you're OB, you have patients who are delivering, yeah. they generally don't schedule times when the de <laughs> delivery is going to come. And so if you have the OR is of course scheduled. And so if to try and to try and juggle those two, so you're actually can be in clinic, which is a totally different location, sort of. Uh, and to try and have all those things mixed, that's not having that drive time makes a huge difference, yeah. right? If you can run across the street, it's a lot different than driving 20 minutes. And now yeah. you're, you're as, one as schedule's any, you get mucked up. As any parent will tell you, babies are, are terribly inconsiderate of anybody else's schedule, including their mothers yes. and particularly their obstetricians. <laughs> so, so yes, being able to run next door and not having to reschedule an entire day was huge. Um, and so that's how, how the year went. Um, and, uh, my wife was in internal medicine 
and uh, she was able to to get out of her practice and join our practice, uh, essentially doing the primary care because I didn't want to do primary care. And obstetricians are in this weird, weird uh, role that that was sort of foist upon us in the 90s by a fear of losing our access to our patients by saying we'll provide primary care as well. And so we all started having to learn uh, vaccination schedules and and primary care routines uh, for which we thought it would be easy because our patients are mostly healthy. But honestly, once you started getting into disease processes and chest pains, we had no right, business yeah, being in. And right. I decided that was not what I wanted to do. Mm-hmm. Uh, but my wife as an internist was perfectly suited for, but she didn't want to be on call and she couldn't be on call because she didn't deliver babies. So that was an ideal marriage. Mm-hmm. Uh, so she joined to see the primary care patients and, and my young partner and I would do the obstetrics. Unfortunately, within the year, my young partner's husband decided he wanted to go be a charter fisher boat captain in Holland. Mm, yeah. So he moved out to Holland, which left me in a new position of being a solo practitioner, which was a bit of a shock. Um, but I rapidly learned that the patients weren't just coming to see a woman. Right, obviously. Well, yeah. I was I had been under the delusion of sorts that women only wanted to see a woman because women were being recruited to all these practices. Right, right. And As my wife explained to me, no, they actually want to see you, which I had trouble believing because I was a guy. Yeah. And I will eternally be grateful to all my patients who actually, turns out, wanted to see me. Mm -hmm. And so I was busy as the proverbial one-armed paper hanger for (laughs) a good long time, delivering babies and doing very well at it. Um, And we kept doing that. Uh, for a good number of years. In the meantime, the gynecologic, the, the normal progression for an obstetrician gynecologist is when you're young, your patients are young. Yes. And as your patients age, so do you. And as your patients age, they stop having babies and they start having gynecologic issues and then need more surgery. And as a gynecologist, you age and don't want to get up in the middle of the night right. as much and like doing the surgery more. And so that has happened as well. And And I have always been I'd say on the cutting edge, uh, but that pun intended sounds, sounds too punny. Yeah. Uh, but I've always liked the gynecology side. I've I've always loved surgery, mm-hmm. and yeah. I've always been uh, very uh, in tune and trying to learn more. And and I started out doing a lot of pelvic reconstructive surgery, which I, I would loosely refer to as suspension work. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> Because uh, I don't work on the bones, I work on all the soft tissues. And as women have, deliver kids, uh, sometimes the kids aren't as kind and gentle to mother's uh, pelvic organs as they could be, and the suspension can suffer. And being able to restore that you know, restores freedom for a lot of women. Mm-hmm. Uh, and and as time passed, laparoscopic surgery has advanced, and I enjoyed more and more laparoscopic surgery, and I'm pretty good at that too. And my personal passion these days is single incision laparoscopic surgery. And I think I'm one of very few people around uh, that does exclusively single incision approaches to some pretty complicated, uh, pretty much anything anybody does, I do laparoscopically as a single incision surgery. And that's now my niche and patients send their friends to see me. Mm -hmm. And so... That so then what we're talking let's talk get into what we were talking about that a, a sure. couple of evenings ago or a couple of months ago now yeah. I suppose. So, your practice is very different from most obstetrical practices. Very. How is it different? Why don't you just describe your practice now, and then we'll then maybe we'll backtrack into how you sort of got there. Well, my my current practice is um, me, Dr. Tammy Michael, and four midwives. And um, the current iteration is a collaborative model. And, and that's, that's something you have to really live to truly understand it because our society, we think very hierarchically. We, we think in terms of administrations. We think in terms of, of a boss and, and, and uh, employees. We think in terms of a general, a captain, yeah. uh, a lieutenant, and, and, and privates. We, we think of being in charge in the chain of command. And a collaborative process is a very different, a di- very different uh, animal. Uh, 
Mm-hmm. And and one of the, the things that I've learned that, that took me some time to learn, and I have a lot of people to thank for that, uh, most notably my sister-in-law, um, uh, who, who is a nurse midwife. Uh, Sarah was a nurse, a labor and delivery nurse for years and was there for the birth of my children. Mm-hmm. And Sarah, about eight years ago, went back to school at Frontier uh, Nurse Midwifery School, which is one of the premier nurse midwifery schools in the country, Mm -hmm. and put three years in to learning how to be a nurse midwife. And and the term midwife, unfortunately, has has suffered from misinterpretation and misunderstanding. Um, Nurse midwives are registered nurses who have a collaborative physician that they work with they work in a medical facility. They have medical malpractice insurance. They have medical licenses. They are trained, and they are absolute experts in normal, uncomplicated vaginal delivery, which means they are the top of the expertise in vaginal delivery. And and I think that gets lost by a lot of people who think that midwives are somehow subordinate, mm-hmm. that the term mid-level provider has has entered uh, the common parlance as as, as somehow a cost-saving measure in, in the business world of medicine. Um, to be a PA or a nurse practitioner, a physician extender. Nurse midwives are not physician extenders. They are care providers. They are the penultimate care provider for an uncomplicated vaginal delivery. So, so it's really different, I think, when, because I actually chair one of the committees that for credentialing in that when it comes to the term mid-level providers, these are people who have less training and they basically are an extension of the physician. And so you either have nurse anesthetists, you have, um, you have PAs, like you said, physician, physician assistants, and they will assist you in surgery. They'll help see patients in the clinic. They'll write some prescriptions. They'll see follow-ups and stuff. But they generally are not ones who have any... They have less expertise than the physician. In Except in this instance, it's different, right? And this It's very different. And so how so how is it different in their... It, just because their training is specifically focused on one thing? In the sense that they just do This, this is right? where you get to, to the, the, the heart of the discussion. What, what, what do doctors do? What are doctors? Doctors, by training, by by intent, we're we're interventionists. Mm -hmm. We are trained to identify disease problems, find a solution, and apply it. And so we do that with medicines. We do that with surgery. Uh, and, And so whenever there's a problem, we come up with a care plan, an assessment and plan, and we apply that to the solution to, to the problem to come up with a solution. Nurses by, by training are supportive. Mm -hmm. Um, so it, if you take pregnancy, which is classified as a disease by the ICD 10, um, and you apply an interventionist to it, you get a national one third C-section rate. Sure. At, at the local institution, you have a 30% cesarean rate. That's with interventionists applied to birth. Mm-hmm. If you take a supportive approach to uh, pregnancy, uh, you end up with between a 10 and 15% cesarean rate with exactly the same pi- patient population. Okay. We are in the middle of doing a study uh, through Michigan State University with their medical students, with our data from from the first year uh, of Sarah joining my practice and looking at the patients before and after. And these are my patients, my practice. And I thought I was pretty darn good. I mean, you got to quit if you don't think you're good at what you do, right? Right, exactly. And, and I had about a 17% C-section rate, which was pretty low. Act, which is right? pretty yeah. darn low. And that's about what the residence, the, the level was when I graduated residency. That's what the institutional rate was. The institutional rate has gone up over the past 20 years uh, to now national averages, which are in the low 30 mm-hmm. percent. Um, Sarah joined our practice. No new patients. She did not bring patients with her. And um, within the first year, she had accomplished a 5 percent primary C-section rate. Now, this doesn't 
this isn't all comers. Repeat C-sections are sure, not included. Yeah, right, uh, yeah. Breaches are not included. Uh, prior cesareans uh, who are trying labor were not included, although their rate has been astonishing. We, we vaginally delivered 50, 49 out of the first 50 prior cesareans who wanted a vaginal delivery in our practice. Um, but our practice was able to, Sarah, essentially, and, and Breck as soon as she showed up, um, were able to to basically on a primary primary vaginal delivery uh, 95% of the time. Right. I mean, that's pretty remarkable. made me feel obsolete <laughs> instantly. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, and where I had been trying to convince my patients that the midwives were okay and that it was okay to see the midwives and that I wasn't abandoning them that the midwives were very good at what they did. All of a sudden I was in a position of apologizing to my patients that they had to see me. They really wanted to see the midwives and I was just there uh, in case. Right. The model I explain to my patients now is, is, is one of, of climbing Everest. I tell my patients, if you climb Everest, the first thing you do is you hire a Sherpa. Now, Sherpas go up all the time, and nobody pays much attention to that, uh, but the Sherpa is not going to carry you up the mountain. That's not their job. Mm-hmm. If you pay them a little extra money, they might help carry some of your stuff. <laughs> but mostly the Sherpa is going to say, it's a good day to go. We have to wait today, and this is the way we go. We don't want to go that way. And if you break your leg, they're going to call the helicopter. Yeah. I'm the helicopter. Mm -hmm. That's my job. And you don't want the helicopter hovering over you all the time, making noise, ruining your experience, making a fuss and, and being annoying. That's not what helicopter note to all the parents out there. You don't want to be that helicopter, but you do want to be immediately available. Mm -hmm. So, and that's where the collaboration comes in. My job is to stay out of the way, but be immediately available. And that involves a lot of trust. Yeah. Both ends. On both ends. Yeah. They have to know that when they call and say, could you assess the patient? That's code for, can you come in right now? Mm-hmm. And the first couple of times I had to learn that. It wasn't a discussion. It was a, no, really, um, I need you here. Mm-hmm. And that phone call made that very clear. And then I came in and it was obvious why. This wasn't a, hey, can you hold my hand and make me feel better? This was, I need you here. And now if I get a, can you assess the patient? I'm on my way Mm -hmm. and they've already let me know that somebody's there and they've let me know how things are going and I'm there. And when I walk in the room, the patient goes, Oh no, it's the (laughs) grand. Um, and most half the time when I walk in the room, they don't need me seeing me as inspiration alone. And, and I've already (laughs) met all the patients because that they have to meet me once me and Dr. Michael, but the patient now knows that, oh, we're at that level. And they're not scared, but they know that it's serious. Mm-hmm. And sometimes that is inspiration enough to push. And so half of the time, half the time, I don't even go in the room. I just need to, they need to know that I'm outside the door. The midwives do. Mm-hmm. But half the time I go in the room and the patient sees that. And half of the time when I'm in the room, I say, hey, you know how we talked about sometime I might have to come in the room and we might have to talk about things? Well, we got to talk. Yeah. And, and that's about 5% of the time we then have to do a C-section and that's okay. And the patient says, yeah, you know, it's time. Yeah. So this is a model that you, again, you just kind of fell into this and now you have four nurse midwives, I believe, right? So four four, four nurse midwives right. and, and we limit them to 10 deliveries per month each because we don't want to be too busy. Yeah, I mean, because you have to be able to sleep at some point, too, because if you have... But they have to be able to know their patients. Yeah, right. Uh, and then, so they're, they're employees of yours, right? And this is where the businessification of medicine has come in. Right. They, they have to be employed by yeah, state right. law. So, yes, they are mm-hmm. my employees. Um, and, and that's unfortunate because it, it that's where the hierarchical model, unfortunately, means I'm their boss, in sure. quotes. But that is not the case. Well, at a minimum, someone owns a building, someone owns exam yes. rooms and there's, you know, there's yes. that aspect of, which there's the I, business of the business. Yeah, sure. Uh, and so your, your C-section rate is super low compared to most places yeah. I mean, for this reason, but you're not the only place that has nurse midwives. I mean, the nurse midwives are everywhere in yeah. medicine. And so, and I don't, and so presumably they have very little effect on the C-section rate at most mm. institutions, right? Our rate is astonishingly low 
until you look anywhere else where they have nurse midwives doing what ours are doing. Now, the problem is very few places do what our nurse midwives are Mm -hmm. doing. Our midwives are in a nurse midwifery practice where they are taking care of their patients as the lead caregiver. Mm -hmm. They are their patients. They have a relationship. These patients are well-educated, understood, cared for, motivated, and, and guided through the process very, very carefully. They're not they're not met the day they're in labor by a laborist midwife who's on shift, who is, they've never met before in their life, who's guided by a physician who's never met the midwife you know, before, right. perhaps, uh, to call in in case of need to do a C-section because the shift is going to change and they want to get out of there. Yeah. Um, which is a natural pressure when you look at the economics of it and the the desire to simplify the lifestyle of the providers. Mm-hmm. I get that. When you're trying to work a shift work job, when you're trying to make ob- obstetrics appealing for providers, I was on 24-7 for 10 years. Yeah. Unless I unless I got somebody to cover my call when I wanted to take vacations, that's not normal. Not an easy sell to get a new grad. No, to get anybody. No, it's yeah. impossible. Now my life was really good because my patients didn't want to bother me because they knew <laughs> yeah, right. that I was the one answering the call, mm-hmm. and so they never called unless they really needed me because they didn't want me to be tired. So being a solo practitioner can be a a, a terribly frightening thing to do. But when you actually do it, you discover that it's not that bad. The limitation is getting call coverage. And my call coverage evaporated uh, about six years ago when the large institution in town took all those groups of four doctors uh, and bought them all yeah so you know i've talked about this show uh, a lot about the thing that drives us into medicine is that relationship we have with our patients and and when you look at surveys of physicians the number one the number one satisfier for physicians is like 85 percent is the professional the thing that drives us professionally is that relationship we have with the patient and so anytime we get in the way of that or have a system set up that diminishes that it really probably psychologically harms the physician uh, in that setting just because you are probably removing the main motivator for what, you, what got you into medicine. Right. And although it's better for maybe marriage or kids because you may have a little more reliability and scheduling and things like that, but in some ways it may be more detrimental than we and t- we think. You lose control. Yeah. It's all about control. In, in every occupation, control is, is the probably the biggest prognosticator of happiness and success and and when you take control away from people they they suffer yeah well i think yeah we all i mean especially in this country right with freedom is sort of like the <laughs> yeah right, as far as what you want um so by all i mean by all, all measures this seems to be a very a work very workable sort of solution and yeah. one that seems to be very i would think people would want this if they're patients yeah uh, is it, how many other places are doing something like this? Is this like is this super uncommon, or is this becoming more? Com- or is, what do you where do you feel? It's becoming more common. Um, the The problem is institutions are are having institutions have trouble seeing midwives as experts. Mm-hmm. They are stuck in the hierarchical model, and they really have trouble. Most institutions plug nurse midwives into nurse roles and nurse becomes a subordinate role Mm -hmm. um, unless they're nursing supervisors. But nurse midwives, that is a clinician of some sort and and it implies extender or physician substitute to most hospital systems. And so they have real trouble 
creating a nurse midwife practice because they see the physician as being in charge of it. When they see the collaborate, because you have to have a collaborating physician, they automatically assume that the physician is then in charge. Do you think that's a more reflection of the physicians and the current sort of psyche of the uh, obstetrical sort of community? Or, yeah. Yeah. I mean, because they're the ones generally in charge of in some ways they're more they're in charge of sort of the flow and how things work within well, a host, within a hospital you right? and i both know a lot of doctors i mean yeah. we've we, we we've even we've even trained uh yeah, perhaps sure. like doctors yeah. and and doctors like to be right and doctors like to be in charge and and doctors are very good at at making decisions and getting things done um and so assuming charge is something doctors like to do and assuming that hierarch- hierarchical role is something we're trained to do, um, which is essentially why we we have an informal fellowship in my practice. We had a partner uh, last year, mm-hmm. Dr. Roberts, who came in uh, from a classic uh, doctor uh, practice yeah. from Banner Health. It, it's it, it's in Arizona. It's a it's a large multi specialty uh, group. It's very effective, very efficient, uh, and and. And she got out of that practice uh, because her husband came to town for a year to do a fellowship. And so she joined our practice for a year and she was raring to go, wanted to see 60 patients a day. She was all up and ready. And and she was kind of shocked at how slow her practice (laughs) was. And and then she realized that we spent a lot more time with people. And then she kind of started to enjoy it. And she started reflecting after about six months how close she had been to burning out how and mm-hmm. she was only two years into practice right how how rapidly she had been pushing herself onto a burnout track by being on that productivity model that is the doctor model and in that working with the midwives she was actually having fun and enjoying it and being a collaborative physician being available and staying out of the way but being able to enjoy that role of being the interventionist, being licensed to all of a sudden be asked to intervene Mm -hmm. when appropriate, saying, this is it. Now can you do it? And saying, yes, I can. And and so she left after a year, I think, having had an eye-opening experience and now more qualified than ever to be a a collaborative physician. And we're working on creating an actual formal fellowship in this Mm -hmm. So because it's something it takes... It takes about six months to get out of the yoke of the hierarchical model to realize what collaboration means, not just to pay it lip service, to mm-hmm. realize you got to back off a little bit. You got to trust. You got to be there. But you got to back off a little bit. Yeah. So, so you think this is a scalable sort of model? I mean... Do you think this is something that do you think this is something that a, a large institution could pull off or do you think because of the nature of the economics of the institution how they look at things that it's not even something that they could would even entertain they want to make doctors do this the institutions yeah. they they view um, physicians as employees yeah and employees do what they're told uh, yeah. that's how businesses work mm-hmm. uh, when you turn a machine on in the factory it should make its part and it, it should do its job. Um, and that's how businesses work. And and that that factory model has been applied uh, with evidence-based medicine and algorithmic management of disease and hospitalists and mid-level providers very effectively. And if I was running a hospital, I would want to apply that as efficiently and effectively as possible to, to maximize, to minimize wastage, maximize outcomes, and do everything as as, as as, as safely as possible to, to make everything perfect. The problem is if you take people and tell them to do something that they're not trained to do, you get resentment. And if you take something that they don't understand or believe can be done, they break it. Yeah. And so you have to have people trained in the collaborative model to be able to apply it properly. And some doctors automatically get it. There are pockets, which is why it works, who, of doctors. Who, and some are motivated uh, financially. Mm-hmm. Fina- I mean, money is the ultimate motivator, right? Historically, money's pretty good. Sure. And, and so some doctors have figured out, hey, 
I don't have to work as hard and I get to have all the fun of being an interventionist and the midwives get to do what they love and I get to still make money. Yeah. Well, that works for me. Mm -hmm. And that's their ticket. That's their incentive to be a collaborative physician. Cool. There are pockets of that. There's a great practice down in Indiana. He's thriving on that. Um, but some are driven by, by uh, altruism. This is what's best for my patients. Those are great, too. Mm-hmm. Don't tend to be the best business people. Yeah. Um, and so, but until hospitals find those people and understand the, that midwives aren't mid-levels, it's it's very hard for them to get that together. Do you, I mean, I feel like these the large. By the way, don't tell them. Will you? It'll ruin my practice. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I I tell you the uh, the listener numbers, and so you're probably safe for a little while. Uh, <laughs> uh, so, one of the things I find with in large institutions uh, is that I think what we and, and this goes for government as well. And uh, when we look at when you have large discussions on policy, you tend to look at the large population. Mm-hmm. And I've talked about this with Dr. Akkad uh, many episodes ago, and where we have population health versus individual care. And so I think I feel like many times in medicine there is there is a an efficiency to be gained with certain uh, uh, routines in the uh, in your facility. Sure, you know, picking up trash. Um, scheduling uh how you get people through through your system yep but there is you if you lose the the focus that that people are different and that they're human and that they're i I think you sacrifice potentially everything in medicine right i mean i think not only and i don't mean to say your soul like you become some soulless creature but i think that's where the burnout comes and i think yeah and i think and i think that's why patients are sometimes so um upset and disappointed with the care they receive. Well, the, the, a, a lot of the things that really frustrate me about obstetrics and, and contemporary obstetrics is, is we're, lo- we're losing a lot of our skills. First of all, um, we're, we're awash in, in what I refer to as sewage and, and, in sewage medicine, in, in medicine, sewage is when S U E, uh, right? Yeah. yeah. Su- sewage is when, <laughs> when obstetricians uh, in this case are constantly functioning, uh, under, under a valve and a lawyer is holding the spigot and, and they're afraid that they're going to open the spigot and dump sewage all over them. Yeah. And, and we're waiting around in sewage in fear of, of, of that valve opening and spilling more sewage on us. And so we're, we're all constantly. Pro, pro, every, people have tried to estimate the cost of protective. I would suggest that every single thing done in medicine is protective medicine, is defensive medicine. Charting right every, alone. Every right, yeah. single cost of medicine these days is defensive medicine. All of the electronic medical records, all of the procedures have their in their at their root defensive medicine. And and this is not only cost the system, it's beginning to destroy our skill set. Because in obstetrics, we're losing our ability to do operative vaginal deliveries. We have residents graduating who do not have skills with forceps. Right. I talked to a, a fourth year resident today who had 16 forceps in four years of residency. <laughs> he was in the room 16 times when forceps were used. And he said he does not feel like he's going to graduate with any comfort at applying forceps. That is a tragedy because we have now, we're about to graduate somebody who is not going to use them when he graduates because he does not feel comfortable because he, he knows that that lawyer is above him with that spigot. And if he puts them on and it's suggested that he's not qualified, he will be sued because the only question that they will ask is why didn't you do a C-section? Yeah. And that's the question in every obstetrician's life for the past 30 years. And it's not just why didn't you do a C-section? Why didn't you do the C-section sooner is the, is the essence of that question. Yeah. And so you can always go back and say, oh, that's when the baby suffered. That's when something went wrong. And so we're losing our ability to do operative procedures on pregnant women in labor. We're losing our ability to assess women in labor. We're losing our ability and we're trading that for a perceived decrease in, in infant morbidity. We think that we're getting better babies out of it, but nobody has demonstrated any increase in, in, in fetal well-being, babies doing better. We've not decreased 
any any number uh, 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 of uh, related to morbidity. But what we have done is we've increased maternal morbidity. We've increased scars. We've increased disease. We've increased infections. We've dramatically increased system costs. Sure. A C-section costs more than twice what a vaginal delivery does. And we have doubled our cesareans over the past 20 years. We have gone from 17% to 34%. We have a pandemic of expense in our hospital institutions. The hospital stay is two to three days longer for a cesarean delivery. The OR costs, the anesthesia costs, not to mention the lifelong ramifications and complications of having a scarred uterus, not to mention the next pregnancy significance. Everything is impacted by this, and we're doing it bit at a time, so the costs are hidden downstream. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, and and as my wife would point out as a pediatrician, the babies do worse in general with a C-section. Right. I mean, they're in the NICU more, they're in the intermediate nursery, or they just, they struggle more. And we are incentivizing the obstetrician to lose their operative skills to do that C-section sooner because the, and the incentives financially, the doctor gets $50 more to do a cesarean. And they can save hours of anguish and grief of everybody looking at that monitoring strip, looking at the obstetrician accusingly saying, why are you letting this baby suffer? Do you know what's going to happen to that child? And the obstetrician's like, you know what? Forget it. We're going to I'm going to go talk her into a C-section. Obstetricians do this all the time because there is absolutely no incentive for them not to because they are interventionists. Yes. And until we change that model and get. I mean, I told you a couple of months ago, I honestly think doctors may have no business in normal, uncomplicated vaginal deliveries. We have the wrong incentives. Physicians are interventionists. It is not a disease. It is a natural process that doctors are trained to intervene when it goes wrong. So stay away when it's going right. Let a midwife do the uncomplicated, normal vaginal. That's what they are experts at. We need to acknowledge that, get them out there, and cut this epidemic, this pandemic of cesareans. So midwives are used in other countries. It, most notably, at least I read about a lot of times when you look at the, the British system, mm-hmm. um, and that I think most deliveries are actually done by midwives in, yeah. in England. Uh, is their practice similar to what yours would be, I guess, here? or it, Pretty similar. Is it? Okay. Yeah, yeah. I, wasn't, I wasn't sure, but I assumed it was probably some... The derivation of that, but I mean, their health, our health systems are very different in other ways too. And and those those system differences. Um, and again, it always comes down to the money. the The economic root of all evils uh, guides and shapes uh, a lot of of the pressures. and And that's one of the challenges, of course, of, of putting mm-hmm. this together. Uh, how to survive? Right, because um, I mean, if you're seeing that someone's coming from practice, they're seeing sixty patients a day, and now they're going to be seeing ten. Right. Uh, Presumably, your your insurance reimbursement's not any better than no. it is in anywhere no. else, and so you've got to find. So, how do you do? You just do more expensive things in the sense that you're just focusing on other types of surgeries and stuff like that, where you get a higher compensation. Well, those ten patients that I'm seeing, half of them, I'm spending an hour with a consult for a complex GYN problem. So, yeah, which is where my skill set is, right? As opposed to seeing forty routine obstetrical appointments and spending five minutes on each of them and not. And spending half the appointment with my hand on the door, and all of those patients say, "Who was that masked man?" Well, now you'd be, they'd just be seeing the back of your head as you're staring at a computer screen. Right? Well, actually, yeah, <laughs> that's and and spending all my time clicking. Uh, we're pretty good about that too. I dictate all my notes that way. I I can actually spend my time talking to the patients. So we're pretty much at the end of our time. Yeah. I can't tell you how much fun it was talking to you about this. I I find it real fascinating. If people want to find out more about you. You're one of those, you're a classic doctor in the sense that you're not in social media. There's definitely been a lot more physicians recently who've been getting engaged in social media, which I think is actually a good thing. I think we need to sort of put ourselves out there and provide our expertise when it comes to medical issues like, you know, whether it's vaccinations or uh, surgeries or whatever it is. I think there's just too much misinformation out there. So I think it's important for physicians to be out there, not to be as afraid, but but you're not on social media. So if... (laughs) So how would people find stuff? I, well, our, about pra- you? our practice is on Facebook. Okay, uh, so there you go. Uh, but the, the midwives take care of that. That That's their fun. What's And what? how would we find your practice? At Advanced OBGYN. Okay. And uh, the practice website is aobgyn.com. 
we managed to get that site real early. My goodness, how did you get that one? That's about, I couldn't even get Paradox. I had to get the Paradox. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We we got that real near. We couldn't get OBGYN.com, but we got AOBGYN.com, which is not not bad. And I'm at DrLegrand.com, okay. which will bring you to the website. Um, you know, thanks so much. And I want to say it's interesting. This since I started the show a year ago now. I was fairly pessimistic about a lot of medicine. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, there's a lot to be, there's a lot broken and, and it's in many ways gotten worse. And, um, but what I found very fascinating in doing the show, it's forced me to talk to different people who are finding solutions or different ways of practicing or different models. And whether it's intentional or not, the innovation is really kind of, it's pretty cool. And it's actually, you see how people are, and physicians especially, are sort of taking back how they think things should be done. Yeah. And I think that's what you've done unintentionally yeah. initially, right? I mean, you're, oh, you're now we, practicing kind of how you wanted to, even though you didn't know this is how you wanted to practice. Exactly. And and happened into this, thank you, thank you to Sarah. She, she stuck with this. She proved that it would work. And I am absolutely loving it. I get to spend so much time with my patients. And I absolutely love what I do and that's something that was really at risk a few years back when yeah it it looked like we were getting boxed out and and I think this is this is a real light yeah I I've seen so many examples of this now through this show and so it's really it's very encouraging and I and I hope if you're because I think my unofficial demographics are half these half the listeners aren't physicians but uh that if that this is something that if, that patients should probably take and think that this is maybe what they want to look for. I mean, they think about, and if they have relatives, maybe you know they want to take a listen and think maybe this is a different way to to practice. So, yeah. anyway, thank you so much for spending the evening oh, with me. My I appreciate pleasure. it. Thank you so much for inviting me. Yeah, my pleasure. <laughs> Thanks for listening to The Paradox. If you like what the doc is doing, please subscribe and leave a review on iTunes or Stitcher. And share the show with your friends. Become a supporting listener to get access to special bonuses at patreon.com forward slash theparadox. Show notes can be found at theparadox.com.